I'm John Bomber, Director of Government Relations with the Arizona Society of CPAs. With me today is Ryan Demena, partner at Demena Public Affairs, and Senator Sean Bowie from Legislative District 18, who's also the ranking Democrat on the Senate Finance Committee. Good to see you, Senator Bowie. Thank you for sitting down with us to give an update to the ASCPA. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Kicking it off, you know, 2020 was an unprecedented year to say the least. Uh, what are some of your takeaways on this past session and interim? Yeah, unprecedented is definitely one word I would use for it. <laughs> um, this was my fourth legislative session. Um, the first session that I've had where there was a global pandemic. So um, <laughs> changed things a little bit. And the timing of it was interesting because, you know, this came and uh, came into our lives around mid-March. Mm-hmm. And as, as Ryan and John know, I mean, that's right around the time where bills are about halfway, two thirds of the way through the process. And, you know, we have over 1500 bills introduced every year, about four or 500 of them get signed into law. And because everything just shut down really quickly. I mean, I remember over having a bill over in the house that was supposed to go to a committee hearing on Monday and it was scheduled and then everything just got shut down and that was it. Um, so because of that timing, I mean, if this had happened two months later, you would have had a lot more bills signed into law. But because of the timing, because everything shut down, we had fewer than 100 bills that were signed into law this year. So that's a lot, that's a lot fewer than we usually have. Uh, a lot of important bills. I mean, the bills that we passed were largely, you know, required bills, um, the budget, conformity, things mm-hmm. like that. So it really stopped stop the train on the tracks a little bit um, yeah. so we weren't able to get as much done as, as usual. It also impacted our state budget. You know, if you remember back in January, the governor gave his state of the state address and he said, hey, you know, we've got a $1 billion surplus out of a $12 billion budget and we're going to invest in education, we're going to invest in infrastructure, a lot of infrastructure projects around the state. Uh, right. All of that went by the wayside. Uh, we passed what was called the skinny budget. Right. Which was bipartisan. Uh, I voted for it, had a lot of bipartisan support. Um, We didn't spend a lot of the dollars that were forecasted to come in because we didn't know what the fiscal impact was going to be with with COVID. Um, We did pass a bipartisan COVID-19 assistance fund that we helped negotiate and we got support for that. So that was good. Um, But we left a lot of programs by the wayside. And back in March or April, the forecasts were really dire. You know, we're going to have a billion dollar deficit. Yeah. When we go from a billion dollar surplus forecast to a billion dollar deficit. Now it's looking like it's going to be a lot more manageable. But again, we just we just don't know what it's going to look like a couple months from now. As you know, our state budget is so reliant on our sales tax and our state income tax. And those are the two revenues, two revenue sources that are really volatile in a, in a downturn in a potential recession. So we're keeping a close eye on that um, going into next year. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to go back to a somewhat regular normal session and in January and, and get back to work. Absolutely. Hopefully that's the, that's the case. You, you mentioned the number of bills this session and, um, you know, there being, I think it was 91 or 90 total that made it out this year that got the governor's signature. Do you expect there to be a greater number of bills next session as a result or will it keep about average, do you think? Yeah, I think in a way you're going to have a backlog of bills that um, came really close this year. I mean, there were good bipartisan bills um, that I either sponsored or co-sponsored, a lot of bills on the majority side that um, would have been signed. We just ran out of time and um, we didn't have time to do the committee process and um, do all of that. So, yeah, we're going to have a backlog. Uh, next year, uh, the Senate president and the House Speaker have already said, you know, if you ran a bill and it, it got through one chamber but not the other, you know, it'll kind of be front loaded for next session. But there's a lot of uncertainty about the legislative session next year. We could have a completely new uh, party controlling the legislature. Um, we could have a tie. Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen with some of these races that are going to be re- really close. But I think you know, the standard uh, kind of agency bills, um, yeah. kind of normal, typical bipartisan bills, we definitely have a backlog of those. So we, we might yeah. be in for a long session next year for a whole number of reasons, uh, that being one of them. Yeah, right. I thought it was noteworthy. You know, John, you've been tracking this as well. And Senator Bowie, you know these numbers, but this was the most, uh, or the historic number of bills introduced in January, followed by historic low in the number of bills passed 
when the time, you know, by the time we signed, he died. So historic session to say the least. Yes. And I'm happy to report, you know, I think there were 89 or 90 bills signed into law. Only two of those bills that were signed into law were Democratic bills and they were both my bills. So <laughs> I was the only Democrat to have a bill signed into law this year. So well done, sir. Something I'm proud of. Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, you you kind of touched on this earlier when you mentioned the skinny budget and session having to end rather abruptly. Um, as time goes on, it seems less and less likely that there's going to be a special session called before November. Um, if one is called, do you expect lawmakers to attempt a wide range of issues to cover, or do you think it'll be more specific? Do you have any sense on that if one is called? Yeah, I mean, we adjourned our session back in May. The thought was that the governor was going to call a special session. And for those who aren't familiar with how a special session happens, uh, there's two ways a special session can happen. Either the governor can call one and he can determine what the agenda is going to be. You know, if he says we're only going to do COVID-19 legislation, you know, you can't introduce legislation on any other issue. Uh, or the legislature can call it. Uh, the legislature, you need a two-thirds majority in both chambers to call a special session. And then at that point, it's open season. And Free, for all. <laughs> Free for all. Free for all. So a lot of folks have said, you know, why haven't you gone into special session? Uh, and you'll get different answers depending on who you ask. You know, our caucus has been very vocal. We've sent multiple letters to the governor going back to, to May and ever since saying we want to do a special session just focused on COVID-19 and helping small yeah. businesses, helping with unemployment benefits and rental protections. And, you know, we've been very vocal about that. Um, some of my Republican colleagues want to go back to kind of clip the wings of the governor because they're upset with the governor and, and a lot of his orders and how he's been using his emergency declaration, which kind of gives him the legal authority to um, issue all the orders that he's issued in the last couple of months. So because it would be a free for all, there's, there's kind of a lack of trust on yep. both sides uh, about what would happen in that special session. Um, and then, of course, the governor can call it, but he hasn't. Um, so we've been very vocal with him about calling that session, but so far he doesn't seem willing to do that. So if we do end up going back at some point before January, I would expect it to be called by the governor and to be focused on COVID-19. And my yeah. colleagues and I are you know, ready to go back to work and, and do that. I don't, I don't expect it to happen before the election if we yeah. do have one it would be in kind of that lame duck session between election day and early January. Yeah. Yeah. If that scenario were to play out, do you anticipate any tax or revenue measures being addressed in that situation? No, uh, the governor has been very vocal since 2014 that he's not going to raise revenue or, or raise taxes. Mm -hmm. And of course, anything that we pass, he has to sign. Um, and we have the two thirds requirement anytime, you know, the legislature wants to raise taxes, you need to there's majority. I don't see that happening with this current legislature. And I don't even know what kind of revenue it would be. Uh, so I think going forward, you know, we do have a rainy day fund. Um, the deficit is forecast to be much less than it was a couple of months ago. So I don't think we need to go down that road. And even if some of my colleagues wanted to, I just don't see there being agreement on, on that kind of issue given our current legislature. Yeah. I think I'd say, Senator Bowie, I'd add that, you know, I think that a special session was really being driven by COVID relief efforts, as well as kind of what was happening with the budget. And I think, as you alluded to, now that we're seeing, you know, rosier budget projections, I think that desire to call folks back into session doesn't really exist with the governor's office. And then, as you said earlier, it's full on open season if the legislature calls it back itself back into session. So... Don't yeah, and, and we're in the middle of a we're in the middle of a campaign right now. The election yeah. is, is not that far away, so mm -hmm. a lot of folks aren't going to want to go back to the Capitol because they're campaigning. Right. Um, so all of those things, you know, are taken into account. Yeah, yeah. And we've mentioned it here a couple times now. The JLBC numbers initially were pretty bleak. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we went from a uh, one billion dollar uh, surplus to a potential shortfall. Now they're looking to level out a bit more and uh, not look as grim. Uh, as the ranking member on finance, do you have any insights as to what the 
fiscal year 2021 will look like after all of this? Yeah, like I, like I said earlier, I think it, it depends a lot on um, what happens with COVID and how soon the economy reopens. Um, you know, we've been pleasantly surprised the last couple of months about the revenue numbers coming in. Yeah. You know, people are, are buying more things, so that's increasing our sales tax revenue and getting back to work. Uh, as you know, I mean, almost 90% of our revenue in our state budget is from those two sources, from the state income tax and um, the state sales tax. So it's really going to depend on how the economy um, does going forward. Um, we've got some uh, measures on the ballot uh, in November initiatives that will potentially increase revenue. Um, I know for the marijuana legalization, it would take some time before those revenues come in and they're allocated for very specific things. Um, but if those pass, and then you have the education one as well, if those pass, it might reduce the incentive for folks to, you know, increase investment in those areas from the general fund yeah. if they're going to be receiving funds from these initiatives if the voters do approve them. Um, so, yeah, we're going to keep a close eye on how the economy uh, changes, you know, obviously we don't want to commit to long-term programs uh, mm -hmm. if we're uncertain about the revenue picture. Uh, in this past budget, you know, a lot of the investments that were being made were, you know, one-time expenditures, things like right. roads and bridges uh, all across rural Arizona. You know, those are good examples of one-time investments that create jobs. Yeah. Uh, we're not committing to them long-term. Uh, so you might see things like that, you know, needed investments that are not long-term um, permanent funding sources and just things that are one time. So it gives us some additional flexibility going into the next couple of years. Yeah. Absolutely. Now with the, you know, you, you said earlier, there's I think 71 days until the election. And, uh, <laughs> not that I'm uh, counting. Not that, you know, uh, uh, operating on the assumption that you win re-election and uh, regular session convenes fairly in a regular sense uh, in January. Uh, what are some of your policy priorities for the coming year? I like that assumption. That's a good one. Uh, if, if I am reelected to represent my constituents in January, uh, obviously COVID is going to be um, at the forefront of the attention and looking at where we are in terms of our budget and if we need to make additional investments and in, you know, things like PPE and resources for our schools trying to reopen businesses. You know, we've talked a lot about um, the safety net and unemployment benefits. Um, yeah. So we're going to take a look at those things. We have a lot of dollars from the CARES Act that the, the governor has not dispersed yet, uh, right. over a billion dollars. So I think there's restrictions on how those dollars are spent. They have to be spent by the end of the year. So certainly we so hope to see those dollars um, pushed out there. Uh, other than COVID, you know, my number one focus has been and will always be education. So getting more investment and support for our teachers and students, not just at the K-12 level, but also at the higher education level as well. I've, yeah. I've spoken to some of our universities and community colleges. They're obviously being really hard hit by COVID-19 and a lot of students, you know, aren't going back or they're taking um, a break here or they're yeah. maybe going part-time and only taking one or two courses. And that's a lot of lost revenue for our universities. And as you know, the state over time has cut a lot of our investment in our state universities and it's caused tuition to go up. And that's something I wanna take a close look at as well. And then another important issue for me is something I've been working on for several years at the Capitol, which is mental health support and Absolutely. additional support uh, in the mental health arena for our kids and, and yeah. for our schools. So that's, that's work I'm gonna be continuing as well. Yeah. Very good, very good. Well, you, you're about to finish your second term going into your third. Do you have anything that you know now that you wish you had known when you were a first year freshman senator? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, yeah. I love my job and you know, you guys know me, I'm a, I'm a policy wonk. So I think I have that in yeah. common with the CPAs out there. Uh, I right. enjoy doing, I enjoy doing the work and for me, you know, I'm not the kind of person that's out there protesting and looking to get on TV. I just, I enjoy doing the work. And um, this pandemic has really put a lot of that into focus because, you know, we got half of a session this year, not even half of a session. Yeah. And that's a lot less time we could be doing our jobs at the Capitol and getting bills passed and, you know, getting things in the budget. And it really deprived us of a lot of that opportunity this year. So uh, if I were to go back and, and tell myself as a freshman something, um, 
it would just be to enjoy it and, you know, try to do as much work as you can and visit as many people as you can. You can't do everything, obviously, That's right. um, yep. but tr try to try to do as much as you can in, in the time that you have, because it really is a privilege. And, you know, we have term limits, which I think is a good thing. And, and folks can't stay at the Capitol forever. So in the limited time that you have there, um, just try to get as much good done as you can while you're there. And I think I've done that. Um, but I would definitely say that to my freshman self if I could. <laughs> Very good. Well, Senator, thank you again for taking the time to give us an update and share your insights with the ASCPA. Before we uh, head out, is there anything else you'd like to say to our membership? Well, just a shout out to all the CPAs in District 18. I mean, just, uh, statewide, you know, love the CPA statewide, but especially I uh, love the CPAs in my legislative district in District 18. And I know I worked uh, really closely with Ryan and the crew and John over there this past session on um, the CPA bill that I know is really important to all of you. And uh, a lot of you wrote to me and I responded and um, was supporting you guys all the way through that. And I'm glad we were able to get a final product out that um, CPAs were happy with. Uh, so I know the difficult work that you do. So uh, appreciate the work you do. And if you need anything from me um, as your Senator, um, please let me know. Perfect. Appreciate, appreciate your, your support. Yeah, my absolutely. pleasure. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen.